Welcome to your program, Power and Counsel. This is Pastor Sammy bringing you a very, very important subject regarding demonic possession. I have with us today the author of Demonic Foes, Richard Gallagher. Dr. Gallagher has been with us before, and it is not necessarily something common that we usually have a lot of people coming over and over because of the time and the effort that it takes to bring them on. But this is such an important topic that we needed to get someone who not only has a lot of exposure about it, knows a lot about it, but has a lot of real hands-on experience about it. Dr. Richard Gallagher has been widely known as one of the scientific experts when it comes to demonic possession, as well as a consultant for exorcists within the Roman Catholic Church. It is my pleasure to now bring back Dr. Richard Gallagher. Dr. Gallagher, can you please introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, hello to your audience and uh, hello to you. Thank you for inviting me back. Um, you know, I'm Dr. Richard Gallagher, so I am a professor of psychiatry. Uh, uh, I'm also, um, you know, a board certified psychiatrist. And I'm actually the longest standing American member now Mm. of a group that meets in Italy of exorcists around the world. It's called the uh, International Association of Exorcists. So, I, you know, I, I studied the classics at Princeton, so I learned a lot about the history of this stuff. But uh, one day I got surprised when a, a priest came to my office and asked if I'd consult on a case. I'd finished my psychiatric residency at Yale, and he wanted to, you know, get a psychiatric opinion. So I always tell people, Pastor, that, you know, I never really volunteered for this, but mm -hmm. somehow in the process, I've gotten very involved in this field and and probably seen more, more serious cases of demonic attack than any other physician in the world. And, and so, you know, I, I think when it comes to God calling us to do something in his uh, divine, I guess, providence, uh, he usually uh, does uh, voluntold, not necessarily that we're volunteering for it, but he, he prepares us with the different aspects of what we're going to do in our life. And he kind of brings us to, and he kind of propels us there. Uh, I do want to ask in regards to uh, a little bit on your scientific and uh, also your spiritual credentials. Can you give us a little bit of insight in regards to your practice uh, in psychiatry and also uh, how that has been used to now being a member of, um, you said the, the membership you have is with the World International Exorcist? Yeah, it's called the International Association of Exorcists. Now, I, obviously I'm not an exorcist, but I have served um, both for them and for uh, a lot of other people as a um, scientific consultant. I actually also teach at a Catholic seminary in New York and I teach a course on this subject. So I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty versed in uh, sort of the ins and outs of this field. And so when, I uh, being that you're a consultant, um, some people might be wondering, how does someone end up being vexed or oppressed or possessed? Is it because there are bad people that involve themselves in really bad things? Are they people that are always, you know, in hoods and doing mantras and chanting some weird uh, pagan ritual? Or is it people that they're good and they're just flat out, they're trying to live a good life, but they end up caught up in a situation where it seems that demons have a target on their head and they're attacked? Well, I mean, the short answer to, to a, a complicated question that you're asking, it's a good question. Um, but the answer is complex. Uh, the short answer is this stuff doesn't come out of the blue. In other words, your average person, certainly your average Christian, shouldn't go to bed at night worrying that this is going to happen to him. There are different levels of attack, and there are different, you know, cultures and different churches around the world use a lot of different languages. The way The way we look at it is when a demon can mostly fully take over the consciousness of a person we call we usually call that a possession if it has you know the other requisite signs um we're all familiar with demonic temptation even though we also have to take responsibility for our own you know sinful 
uh, behavior if that occurs. In between that, there is a there's a kind of mid level of attacks that are not fully possessed, um, but for instance, the, the person may get physically attacked or even in some ways mentally influenced to a extreme degree. And those we those people use different terms of, they usually call oppression. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, although other people have different terms, I think you use the word vexed. Some people call it uh, harassment. Some people, um, again, have other terminology. Mm -hmm. um, but to get back to your question, um, when, it's, when it's at its most extreme, a possession. It is usually, but not always, people who have, on some level, maybe even unwittingly, but on some level have invited the spirit in. Uh, and they've invited it in by either turning to something very sinful, sinful behavior in itself. Uh, and I'm talking about, you know, serious sins can open the uh, human personality to demonic influence. Um, at the same time, these people may or may not have turned to occult stuff. Or they may have turned to witchcraft or they may have turned to uh, serious levels of spiritualism. You know, what is sometimes called the spiritismo where people are trying to contact and communicate with spirits. Usually, Pastor Sammy, it's one or both of those two things that leads to uh, a possession in certain individuals, not everybody, but in certain individuals. Um, now there are exceptions to that. For instance, there are sometimes um, very uh, holy people who in God's providence, because you know it, it's not that God causes this, but you know, God in the mystery of uh, God's providence, God sometimes allows certain people to be attacked. It may be for, you know, penance for other people. It may be for some kind of spiritual lesson. That, that stuff is fairly rare. It is fairly rare that a good person gets possessed. Um, but I have seen a few of those cases and it's been certainly reported in history. Now, when, you, when you're talking about the lesser attacks like oppression, mm -hmm. Once again, it's the same sort of context. Um, most of the people who get these more minor attacks of oppression, they also have either gotten involved with something, you know, occultic, like again, turning to spiritualism or dabbling in something, and or they have opened the door, so to speak, by their own sinful behavior. Um, usually those people are uh, attacked. And in fact, oppression is, is much more common than possession. And occasionally you will see it in a, in a truly good person. Uh, I write in the book, Demonic Foes, thank you for mentioning that, you know, um, the first case I actually dealt with was a woman who was getting beaten up by evil spirits. Uh, now, she was a very good person. Mm. I mean, she was very involved with the pro-life movement. She was very charitable. She was a married woman who, you know, was a good woman. Now, in her case, uh, she did think that she was cursed by a local sort of witch doctor or brujo. Uh, and uh, that does seem to happen even sometimes to reasonably good, good, good people. Uh -huh. Although the more common path, even for oppression, is that the person has turned to something unwise, either sin or some kind of dabbling in, you know, pagan ritual or witchcraft or something like that. Now, now this this uh, this case that you're talking about, this woman, uh, this this is mentioned in your book. But before we we go on, uh, I I have a copy of your book. And I remember that I waited for quite a while to get a hold of that book. And it, it turns out that 
by the time it was released, they kept on kind of changing the date of when it was going to be released. But I was like, I had already paid it ahead of time. But by, by the way, I really wanted to get a hold of that book, especially coming from the mental health perspective. I wanted to take a look at that at this. Uh, but before we go on with these cases, Dr. Uh, Gallagher, can you tell people where they can uh, get the book. Uh, I, I know I have it in hardcover. Is it av available already in, in uh, soft cover already? Well, uh, again, thank you for mentioning it. it. It's very easily available. It's, it's published by Harper uh, Collins. You can easily get it through their website, or most people actually get it through Amazon. And the hardcover is very available. Uh, the paperback is coming out in um, probably in a month or two. Mm. So you know, I imagine that'll be a little cheaper. Yes. You can also get an audio version. I had a um, a guy I know who's a uh, kind of a Shakespearean actor. And oh, wow. He, he narrated the book and he does a, a, a marvelous job. And mm -hmm. uh, I think I think Amazon has a deal where you can get it for free if you, you know, uh, join Amazon or something like that. So it's widely available, especially uh, especially on Amazon. It, it will... Uh, it if I may plead uh, or ask, I'm asking, but I'm also pleading. Will it also be uh, done in, in Spanish? Uh, is it is a book available in Spanish? And will the audio be available in Spanish within time? No, I actually would imagine. I mean, um, believe it or not, it was it was uh, it translated and published in Japan. Oh, wow. We have a great interest in this stuff. And it was also translated and, and it's um, um, out in Poland as well. It was translated into Polish. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that the idea that it would be, um, you know, translated into Spanish is actually a very good one. Mm -hmm. I, I have a good friend in um, South America who's a, um, he's actually a psychiatrist who likes me, who like me, believes in this stuff and mm -hmm. does consultations. And, you know, he's, he's offered to help uh, translate it. So, it may well happen at some point. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Don't have, I, I think we don't have a Spanish edition right at the moment. It it has to happen, Doctor Gallagher, because this is something that is specially, uh, it, it, and that's the reason I'm bringing you in is because uh, either people totally ignore this subject, or they go to the extremes of of making it so uh, fantasy driven that uh, it's laughed at and it's not really taking it seriously. And it reminds me of what Suez Lewis. I once said that, you know, he said, uh, the devil likes two things, either for us to totally ignore that he exists, or number two, to blow his existence out of proportion. And, and so going back to that case of that woman, uh, because here's the question is where some people say, do good people get demonically possessed? Well, you have some cases here. Can you contrast uh, between some of these uh, cases of people who actually turn to something really dark and it ended up with them being possessed or a good person that ended up being either oppressed or eventually possessed. Uh, can you give us a little bit more details about that woman that you were mentioning? Uh, you know, the, the one that you had uh, just a, a while back mentioned, uh, brought up. Well, first of all, I love that C.S. Lewis quote. In fact, I like it so much that I put it in the book. Um, uh, again, to reiterate, uh, Pastor, uh, you know, it's not common for really good people to be possessed. I mean, some people, I think, you know, sometimes almost like invited in unwittingly, they 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 should not be doing that, but they want to, you know, sort of suffer for our Lord, that sort of thing. And that's usually regarded as imprudent. But there's no question that, you know, some very decent people can get attacked in lesser ways. And that's the example of the woman, you know, I start off the book with, uh, in a way, by saying that she was a very good woman who was beaten up by spirits. And, you know, we could find no medical or psychiatric reason why that happened. She felt she was cursed. Um, in terms of, you know, these individuals who are very much turning to evil, uh, including possibly witchcraft or, or Satanism, those people really are very vulnerable. And you may you may be referring now to a woman who was a um, outright devil worshiper. Um, you know, as a psychiatrist, I'm aware that there has been hysteria about, you know, apropos C.S. Lewis, right? There has been hysteria about 
you know, Satan is being all over the place. Uh, I don't subscribe to that. You know, I think sometimes I've heard stories about delusional stories about, you know, satanic attacks and all that. Having said that, there are a few of these people. This was one of the rare examples. And uh, what was kind of remarkable is it was an incredibly flamboyant case. And, you know, uh, the priests who were working with her, they didn't really, they didn't really need me to uh, discern the um, um, possession because it was very obvious. I mean, she had so many characteristics of a possession, like during the exorcism, she spoke in foreign languages. She had the superhuman strength. She had all kinds of paranormal things that would happen in and around her. And, and in fact, she had psychic abilities of her own, which she knew and admitted to me were directly gifts of Satan. So this was the real deal. And it was also uh, a Satanist. And, you know, kind of remarkably, too, she was willing to talk to me. So I learned about her background. The reason she was referred to me was not because the priest had doubts about what was going on with her, but it's because of her ambivalence. And they wanted me to talk about with her, you know, why she was so hesitant to consistently get exorcisms. She eventually had about eight of them. Wow. And then she was scared. She was scared of the cult, but she also had these kind of paranormal abilities. You know, she had something called remote viewing, for instance. Mm. She could see things at a distance. And it's it's a kind of paranormal um, ability or power that she believed that she possessed, uh, so to speak, because she was, you know, uh, uh, devoted to Satan. And of course, as long as she was in the cult, which she was scared of, and as long as she remained following Satan. This is a woman who would never be freed, you know, because you have to be willing to be right. freed. You have to be willing to reform your life and you have to be willing to turn to a godly life and to God. Or as we Christians would say, you have to be willing to, you know, follow Jesus. And um, so she was never delivered. Uh, and the reason was, you know, she had this internal ambivalence that she talked to me, but eventually she dropped out because in some ways she was uh, too scared to continue. Mm -hmm. And of course she was never delivered. Mm -hmm. So that's a good example of a person who was never delivered mm -hmm. as opposed to the people who do get delivered from possession and from oppression. And those are people who really work at it. So, you know, Hollywood has this, um, and, and by the way, they are going to make a Hollywood movie out of that woman's case. Oh, wow. But Hollywood, you know, tends to um, get it wrong by acting like the whole thing is a kind of magic ceremony or something. Mm -hmm. uh, in part, the prayers of the church and of different churches, uh, you know, I'm most familiar with the Catholic Church, which probably has, you know, the most experienced exorcists by and large. But, you know, there are other good deliverance ministers in other churches, of course. And um, uh, the prayers of the churches in the name of Jesus are very, very valuable. But one shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the person has to reform their life. They have to combat the problem, whether it's oppression or possession, with their own spiritual efforts, by becoming more devout, by praying more, you know, we like to say in the Catholic Church by, you know, going to the sacraments and, you know, saying prayers like the rosary. And, and you know how you're saying that that's that's a very good point, because a lot of people. When they're consulting for help, uh, it is because a lot has already gone on and they're needing help, but they're, once they get help, it's like they go back to the very same thing. It's almost like going to your primary care doctor and your, your sugar level is going up and, uh, or your blood pressure is up, you know, through the roof and they tell you, well, you know, here's the medication, but you're going to have to change this, this, and that. And, and they're taking the medication, but they're not changing everything else. So guess what's happening is that you, you come either the, the problem is still there or it gets worse, you know, and, and you can't just blame and say, well, what happened? You know, you, I think your point, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, you know, pastor, if I can interrupt, that's a very yes. good comparison 
it's a very good analogy. And of course, I'm a physician. And, you know, sometimes things happen, you know, cancer often happens from random mutations. So, you know, uh, we certainly don't uh, judge people who have illnesses. But uh, a fair amount of illnesses, uh, as you say, the medications help or other treatments help, but often the person have, has to work on their health. Uh -huh. It's a very close analogy to, um, say, someone who is possessed. You know, we can diagnose the possession, we can say prayers with them, which are valuable and important, but unless they're willing to reform their life, you know, give up their sinful behaviors, or in extreme cases, you know, leave dark cults or practices, uh, they're never going to get better. And that's that's something that sometimes the public doesn't really understand. Mm -hmm. Because as with people who go to doctors, as with people who go to psychiatrists, uh, like myself, you know, often people want a magic answer, but you know, you have to you have to work at getting better too. All right, and so like I I would like to see dive into some of the the, the cases that you have in the book, uh, and, and give more attention to that because I know the last time that we met, uh, there was so many uh, different topics that we we juiced out of the the book, but uh, not necessarily looking into some of the actual cases of the book. Uh, is there one, uh, maybe one or two cases from the book that you would like to kind of bring out in regards to the importance of maybe either good people getting, uh, you know, oppressed or, or, or possessed or people who flat out got involved in some very dark things and it, this is what it resulted in? Well, uh, actually, I've, I've seen quite, quite a few cases, but I do, as you imply, highlight in the book some of the more dramatic ones. Um, now, for instance, there was a, uh, a guy who was a, um, a gangster, and he had turned to uh, Santeria, and he had turned to a life of crime, and he got possessed. And it was only after, um, you know, he and his wife came for help, uh, you know, she told me that not only was he going into trances, speaking Latin, and even levitating from the bed, but you know he he clearly had all the signs of uh, um, you know a classic possession. Now he's he's a guy who eventually not only turned to the church but also reformed his life, mm -hmm. and he did very well. Uh, another woman I mentioned in the book, uh, I, I would say she was seemingly less um, blameworthy. Uh, she's a person who. Um, whose mother was a um, practitioner of Espiritismo and supposedly con uh, consecrated her to a spirit when she was born and wanted her to, wanted the daughter to take her place as a spiritualist healer. Now she got, she got possessed too. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, it's not like she had led a completely blameless life, but she was basically a good person. Certainly by the time I saw her, she was a very good person. And she really, you know, she really uh, worked on her uh, religious life and became very faithful a follower. And she was delivered in two sessions, you mm -hmm. know. So that's another good example of someone who, you know, less for their own than for their own fault, but, you know, possibly because of, say, the, uh, she also felt she may have been cursed by a cousin, uh, got involved in this, you know, in most ways, not not through her own you know, behavior, but because of that. Uh, now, again, basically a good person. She worked She worked with the priest. She had two exorcisms and was successfully delivered. Often it takes longer than that. Mm -hmm. A third case I highlight in the book was a woman who, um, she um, got involved as a young teenager with a couple of probably pathetic Satan worshipers in her neighborhood. And they also, you know, sort of consecrated her to to a spirit, which was really to a demon, and and she got possessed. And she originally went to um, uh, a Protestant uh, minister mm -hmm. to be delivered. Um, I don't think he was very experienced because they didn't hold her down when she went into the trance. And this woman who was ninety pounds, soaking wet, yeah, two hundred pound uh, Protestant deacon across the room. Mm -hmm. Eventually she, she found some uh, 
you know, Catholic priest who um, who did who did who did help her eventually. Um, still one more case, uh, and I always change the names in the locale in, in the book. I, I I call her by the name of Catherine. Now she had been involved in, uh, you know, sort of as a teenager in some minor rituals to Satan. It may well have involved a aborted fetus. And she got possessed. Now she had some very dramatic features again, which made it obvious after a while that she was uh, possessed. For instance, um, her hearing was blocked. So demons can do all kinds of these weird things. You know, they can physically attack someone. They can actually plant very strong mental images in the brain, and that's that that can sometimes happen even in people who are not oppressed. And in our case, they could also block her senses. Mm -hmm. Doctor, so, can you expand on that? Because I, I remember that from your book on how there was some people that, uh, that were possessed. And, and by the way, be, before we go on, I want to point out something uh, in regard to some people, you know, you will always question and, and, and you have your skeptics, you have your critics, and they'll say, well, a lot of this is psychiatric, but uh, when someone is going through a psychiatric uh, episode, for example, uh, they're not levitating on their own. They're not defying gravity, you know? So uh, yeah, that, that is supernatural. That has nothing to do with, with psychiatry anymore. Now, uh, but I want to get into why is it, like, can you give me at least one case uh, or, or some cases about how the senses are blocked? Because uh, I, I know, uh, as a matter of fact, in your book, and recently, I heard of another case about how uh, a woman who was, you know, secretly, I mean, she had done some stuff, like you said, when, she, you know, when some people do dumb things when they're teenagers, but now that she's a, a grown woman, you know, she's trying to, she has kids. And, you know, there's something that happens to people when they have kids. They want to uh, forget everything, all of the, the dumb things that they did when they were young, but now they're trying to live differently. And, you know, she started trying to go to church. And, and it turns out that in, in the process of, of trying to, to be there, there was a, a, you know, a reading of, of scripture from the Episcopal Dictionary, as a matter of fact. And, and then she started reacting. And what she did quickly was she, every time that comes up um, for the liturgy or for uh, the communion, uh, she would run to the restroom because she felt like vomiting. And I, I believe there's a similar case uh, in your book in regards to that or the numbing, not, not being able to hear. Can you give us some information on that? Yeah, that, 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 that was this case I was talking about. And remarkably, what would happen with her is the sense of hearing would be blocked selectively. Uh, she also claimed pain in her ears at times. And she was checked out by a lot of medical doctors and checked out by me psychiatrically. There was, there was no psychiatric or medical cause for her hearing problems. But the hearing, interestingly, was very selective. Mm. So for instance, you could talk to her about shopping. Uh, you know, when people are possessed, they, they, they go in and out of these states. And when they're out of the state, they're, even though the demon is there, when they're out of the state, they can, you know, somewhat lead a fairly normal life. So this woman would do cooking, she would go shopping and, you know, she could tell me, you know, when I asked her questions about what she had done, she could say, well, you know, this morning I, you know, I drove the car to the uh, gas station and I picked up some, some groceries. But if you asked her, which I did, uh, along with another psychiatric colleague of mine, we would ask her, um, do you pray or do you go to church or do you believe in God? And she would look at us quizzically and say, you know, I, I can't hear what you, I, I can't hear what you're saying. Wow. So she couldn't hear anything of a spiritual nature. So, uh, you know, bright as we thought we were, we figured we'd, we'd write down these questions and the exact same thing happened. Wow. So we'd write a question like, um, uh, Catherine, I call her again, not a real name. All the facts of the book are absolutely true, but I do change people's names and locale. And we would write down a question like, um, um, you know, what did you do over the weekend, you know? And she could answer, fine. And then we wrote down the question, you know, did you pray today? Did you go to church? And she looked at us with a somewhat pained expression. And I remember her saying to me, Dr. Gallagher, why are you showing me this blank piece of paper? 
Wow. So she had a very selective loss of hearing. Now, there are other people who have almost constant loss of hearing or sight. Uh, again, that that this is kind of rare, but it's the kind of things that, you know, you see in someone who's possessed, these bizarre features. And as you say, you know, as I always say to people who think this is all psychiatric, which in the cases I write about in the book, definitely psychiatry conditions had been, and medical conditions had been ruled out. You know, I, I say exactly what you said. I said, you know, how many mental patients do you know who can levitate, who, you know, speak foreign languages or who have this, you know, secret knowledge about things, which they could only get from the spirit world. And, and in your book also, uh, it, it talks about how even in the process of uh, deliverance or exorcisms, even the, the temperature uh, drops. And uh, I, I know that we have another program about the Skirvin Hotel in Oklahoma. And uh, I, I know that I was in, with, uh, you know, uh, other professionals, other medical professionals, particularly more, um, you know, therapists and, and registered nurses. And they had an incidence where they were walking down the stairway and they literally, because it's known as I mean, a, a hotel that's haunted, and they could feel the temperature just dropping in, in certain parts of the, the building. And, but I'll tell you this, you know, you had asked me before we started the program about uh, deliverance and uh, we were, me and, and one of the other uh, pastors were in, a, a, you know, doing some kind of ministry to a, a person actually this Sunday. And as you're mentioning, this came to my mind, uh, Dr. Gallagher, because although she didn't say anything about her ears, uh, she did say something about a presence in her head. And we were praying for God to deliver her. And uh, as the Lord directed me to, to, for her to be ministered, and we were ministering to her, it's weird because my, my hearing kind of got a little bit on the echoey side. And in, I, I don't, at first I was thinking, is this some kind of a counter transference? You know what I mean? That's what we call it in calcium. But uh, she did not say anything about the hearing. Have you, did you experience anything uh, in a nutshell? Because we're almost out of time, but uh, where demons affected even, like we're talking about the senses of the possessed. Do they attack sometimes the person or the minister or the people around uh, in their senses as well? I, I I haven't had direct attacks on me, thank, mm -hmm. thank the Lord. Uh, I certainly know a lot of priests and you know ministers like yourself who, in the course of their work, you know, have experienced some some odd stuff. Um, uh, you know, the example you were given in Oklahoma was what we would call an infestation. You know, so it's it's kind of a demon's evil spirits affecting a place, and you will you will see a lot of these odd phenomena. Sometimes people. Sometimes spirits will appear and, you know, it's not just people's imagination or psychosis. In, in the case of the Satanist woman that I talked about during her exorcism, all kinds of, uh, you know, weird things happened. And for instance, for a while, the room became very hot. And then at another point, the room became very, very frigid. So, um, you know, this was reported to me. I didn't go to that particular exorcism, although I've been to a lot in my life. Uh, this was reported to me by, you know, eight people, which, you know, maybe um, I can comment on sort of the, the scientific nature of this. Obviously, the demons are not going to allow themselves a lot of times to be captured on, on camera. So you can't do experiments with them. And, you know, some people ask for evidence that, you know, is unrealistic. Mm -hmm. But from a scientific point of view, you know, the evidence is historical, the evidence is testimony, most of what we know in life is testimony. And, you know, if you really, if you really, you know, read the accounts, not just of myself, but of, you know, literally hundreds and hundreds of priests, and ministers throughout history, uh, you'll see that there's actually very, very good historical evidence for that. Mm -hmm. And then you decide, I mean, God, God gives us a certain amount of evidence and testimony. Uh, he doesn't hit it. He doesn't hit us over the head with it. So in, a, in some ways we have to search out and, and then decide what we believe. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gallagher. And for everybody else, if you have not yet done so, and this is the first time that you encounter our program, we humbly ask you to please hit on the subscribe button 
the follow button or the notification bell and leave us some comments below on some questions that you may have about the nature of the topic that we discussed today and we will try to answer your questions as well. Uh, remember that we are on Spotify audio podcast. We are on Rumble and YouTube. So please create a free account there and help us out by subscribing as well. Dr. Gallagher, thank you so much. I would like to ask you uh, to end our program. Could you, in a nutshell, um, give a word of power and counsel to maybe someone who is secretly struggling with something that they've done in the past, and it's been a long time ago, but it seems to be kind of haunting them, and they're experiencing some strange phenomenon in their life, uh, and they're afraid that it is what we're talking about, and they just don't want to say it. Can you just give them some word of encouragement of power and counsel for their life? Well, you know, I didn't, I didn't read the book to, to scare people and the average person, especially the average good Christian is not really gonna, you know, have, have things happen to them, um, except under very extraordinary circumstances. But the kind of person you're, you're talking about, I mean, you know, they have to kind of accept that, you know, God's providence allows for all kinds of things. And maybe some of this is a wake up call if they're now experiencing something real and they have to turn back, you know, to to the church, to their spiritual practices. Ultimately, they have to turn back to Christ because, again, it's not even the exorcist who delivers people. It's our Lord, our Lord himself. That's what that's what they need to realize, because it's, it's, it's very easy for people to get confused about that stuff. And if they don't have any religious belief, in some ways, they become more confused. I've often had people say to me, well, how come this only happens to Christians? Which of course is total nonsense. It, it happens much, demonic attacks happen much more to people who are, you know, pagan or, you know, having anti-Christian beliefs. And if you do not have someone that you can rely on, we ask you to reach out to us and we will be more than glad to help you point to someone that can help you in your area. And we would be more than glad to minister to your life. Remember that we are here to make an impact and to help you live a life that is free and not only free, but walk on water. Second Corinthians chapter 10 verse four, as a matter of fact, says that our weapons are weapons that we are not just wrestling with flesh and blood, but we are, this is a spiritual war, but we see it in the physical. So up until next time, please reach out and we will be more than glad to help you. Dr. Uh, Gallagher, thank you so much. It is an honor to have you in our program and we honor your life. May God bless you. May God bless your book and everything that's coming out of the book. And we hope that there's a, a second part to this book as well. Uh, thank you. You're very welcome. And I'm shameless in asking your audience, given the work I get involved in, please pray, please pray for me as well. Okay. No, uh, we, we will. And everyone else, until next time, thank you for joining us. See you again here in your program, Power and Council, where together we will supernaturally continue to walk on water. Be blessed.